Welcome to part two of natural deduction. In this video, we're going to look at the rest of the eight implication rules used in proofs by natural deduction. And this video is based on the fourth edition of the textbook logic by Stan Baronet. Simplification is a rule that lets you move from a conjunction to one of the conjuncts. You can see there's two versions of it. One um, derives the first conjunct P from the conjunction P dot Q. And the other one derives the second conjunct Q from the same conjunction. So you can do either one with this rule. So here's an example in the natural language. Oak trees are deciduous and pine trees are coniferous. Therefore, oak trees are deciduous. So you can just take either conjunct, the first or the second, and derive it from that conjunction using simplification. And intuitively, the reason why this rule makes sense is that if we know a conjunction is true, we know each of the conjuncts are true individually as well. Another implication rule is conjunction. Uh, this is abbreviated CONJ or C-O-N-J. Um, the form is you have two propositions on separate lines of your proof. So P and Q, for example. And this rule allows you to take those two propositions and join them with a dot or conjunction in between. So intuitively, the reason why this rule makes sense is because if you know that each of those propositions is true separately, you can also say they're both true together. So you're basically just asserting both of those propositions are true. So here's an example. The month of July is named after Julius Caesar. The month of August is named after Octavian Augustus. Therefore, the month of July is named after Julius Caesar, and the month of August is named after Octavian Augustus. So um, the thing to keep in mind here is that um, the order of the conjuncts can vary. It doesn't matter for the purpose of this rule whether P occurs first on an earlier line of the proof or if Q occurs first. You basically can choose what order you want to put them in when you use the conjunction rule. And that's just a reflection of the fact that for all of these logical rules um, that use multiple premises, um, it doesn't matter which order the premises occur in as long as you have all those premises, both premises that fit the form of the argument it still can work using the same rule. Addition is another implication rule. This one allows you to go from any proposition and you can add any other proposition you want after the wedge. Remember with all of these statements of the form of implication rules, the lowercase p or q or other lowercase letter could stand in for any proposition, whether simple or compound. So it's a meta variable. The lower case P can stand for a simple proposition like a capital letter P or a compound proposition like P dot Q. So there's flexibility in how we apply these rules. But addition is special because it allows you to introduce completely new simple propositions into an argument. So for example, if you have some premises that contain the simple propositions P, Q, and R, and the conclusion contains the simple proposition S, you might be wondering, well, where the heck do I get S from if it's not already there in the premises? Addition allows you to introduce that new simple proposition after a wedge. And let's look at an example to illustrate why this rule makes sense. Mount Everest is the tallest mountain on earth. Therefore, Mount Everest is the tallest mountain on earth or butterflies eat babies. Now, this may seem really weird and it is in this example. This, the disjunct that we're adding is butterflies eat babies, which we all know is false, thankfully. Um, but what makes this a valid inference is that the first disjunct is still true. So if you have some true proposition, you can create a disjunction out of it and add whatever you want as the second disjunct but logically speaking, that disjunction is still gonna be true. Because remember, even if the um, second disjunct is false, 
um, the disjunction as a whole is still going to be true as long as it has at least one true disjunct. So when you say P or Q, A or B, you're not guaranteeing that they're both true. You're just saying, well, at least one of them is true. B might be false, but then A is going to be true. So the compound proposition P wedge Q um, is still going to be true even if the second disjunct is false. So that's why um, this rule makes sense logically, and you can use it to introduce new simple propositions uh, in symbolic form, new capital letters to an argument, to a proof. Construct the dilemma is an implication rule that starts out with two premises. One of them is a conjunction of conditionals, and the other is a disjunction whose disjuncts match the antecedents of the conditionals in the conjunction. So you'll notice that pattern. The general form is parenthesis P horseshoe Q close parenthesis dot open parenthesis R horseshoe S close parenthesis. So the P and the R and the antecedents of those conditional match the disjuncts in the wedge P wedge R. So you have to have that pattern to use this rule. Um, and it allows you to conclude that the a disjunction formed out of the consequence of those two conditionals, Q wedge S. So here's an example. When I vacation in Hawaii, then I surf. And when I vacation in Colorado, then I ski. I'm going on vacation to Hawaii or Colorado. Therefore, I will surf or I will ski. So intuitively, this argument makes sense. One thing to note about the wording on the first premise is that it uses the word when instead of if. So occasionally you can use the word when to set up a conditional, but logically speaking, we interpret it with the horseshoe. Because if you think about the use of when in this sentence, it's basically the same as the word if. So if it's true that, I've been, that I vacation in Hawaii, then I will surf. Um, and the key thing to remember about constructive dilemma is that you do need to have a conjunction of conditionals. So it's common in a proof to have those conditionals on separate lines, you have to join them together with the dot in order to fit the form of constructive dilemma before you can use the rule constructive dilemma. So here's a summary of the second four implication rules. Um, simplification allows you to start from a conjunction and then prove one of the conjuncts. Conjunction allows you to start from separate uh, propositions and join them together in a conjunction. Addition allows you to introduce a wedge after any proposition you know is true and then have a disjunct whatever you want after that wedge. And then constructive dilemma allows you to start from a conjunction of conditionals and a disjunction whose disjuncts match the antecedents of those conditionals and then conclude another disjunction whose disjuncts match the consequence of those conditionals. So let's look at some tactics for using this second set of implication rules. One tactic is if the conclusion appears as a conjunct in one of your premises, try using the word simple, uh, try using the rule simplification to derive it. So in this case, we have a conjunction P dot parenthesis Q horseshoe R close parenthesis. So the second conjunct is a compound proposition, but that's the one that we want as our conclusion. So we can use the rule simplification to simplify out the second conjunct from that conjunction. Remember, simplification can be used on either the first or the second conjunct that appears in a conjunction. Another tactic is if the conclusion is a conjunction, First, identify and derive the conjuncts and then use the conjunction rule to bring them together. So in this case, we're going to have to do some work before we can use the conjunction rule. The thing we're trying to prove is R dot S or R and S. And we can see R and S in premises two and three, but as consequence of conditionals. So we're going to have to derive R and S separately on their own um, on lines of the proof before we can join them together with the conjunction rule. So in order to derive R and S on separate lines, so we can then set ourselves up for conjunction, we have to first simplify out P and Q from premise one. So if we have P by itself, we can then use P with 
line two and modus ponens to derive r. You can see we did that on line six. And then once we have q by itself on line five, we can use q with premise three to derive line seven. We can use modus ponens on q horseshoe s and q to derive s. So it's a nice illustration of using several rules um, together to help us to derive our set up our conjunction because then we have r and s separately on their own lines that means we know they're true on their own on line six and seven and then we can use conjunction on them to get the main conclusion that we're looking for another tactic is if the conclusion does not appear in any of the premises then we should use addition to introduce it so in this case we have only one premise p and then we're trying to prove p wedge q dot r well notice the parenthesis q dot r contains simple propositions q and r that are not in our premises so we know we're going to have to use addition to introduce them in this case it's easy it's just a one-step proof because um, the conclusion is itself a disjunction so we can just use addition to introduce both the wedge and our second disjunct exactly as we need it. Another tactic is if the conclusion is a disjunction, try using constructive dilemma. So you will not only use constructive dilemma to prove a disjunction, but it's one way to do so. So in this case, you'll notice the conclusion is Q wedge S and we can see Q and S as the consequence of conditionals in premises one and two. That is a clue that we might be using constructive dilemma to derive Q and S. However, in order to do so, we need another um, premise. We need a disjunction that matches the antecedents of those conditionals. And the antecedents are P and R. So what should we do to help set ourselves up for constructive dilemma? Well, in order to finish this proof, we have to first start by simplifying p wedge r out of premise three and then we can make a conjunction of premises one and two and then we have lines four and five which match the form of constructive dilemma perfectly we have a conjunction of conditionals on line five and we have a disjunction on line four whose disjuncts match the antecedents of both conditionals on line five and they have to be in the same order as well so the first disjunct has to match the first antecedent and the second disjunct has to match the second antecedent. Once we have that form set up, we can use constructive dilemma to derive the disjunction Q wedge S, which is our main conclusion. So now let's look at some sample problems. Um, these are fill in the blanks where we have to figure out what implication rule to use to complete the proof. So in this case, we're starting with the premise R and then we're concluding on line two R wedge open parenthesis P dot tilde Q close parenthesis. So what rule can we use to derive that? The answer is addition. So we can use addition to add a wedge and whatever we want as the second disjunct after our first disjunct. Um, and remember this rule may be counterintuitive, but the reason why it works is because we know the first disjunct R is true. So logically speaking, it doesn't matter. We could put anything we want after the wedge the disjunction as a whole would still be true, even if the second disjunct turns out to be false. Another sample problem, um, we're filling in the blank on line two. So we start with the premise, um, the conjunction, and then we're trying to prove one of the conjuncts, tilde, open parenthesis, P, wedge, Q, close parenthesis. So what rule is that? This is a pretty uh, clear case of simplification. The only thing is remember, we can use simplification on conjunctions where one or both of the conjuncts is um, itself a compound proposition, as you can see in this case. So in this problem, we are given the um, line numbers, the premise numbers that we use, and the rule, in this case, conj or conjunction. And we have to figure out what should we write on line three? What does it look like when we use conjunction on lines one and two? So we have a conjunction here of two disjunctions. So we have to introduce sets of parentheses to remove ambiguity. Whenever we use the conjunction rule, the dot is gonna be the main operator. So the wedges are not gonna be the main operator. To indicate the, their limited scope, we do have to introduce sets of parentheses around each of those compound propositions that are now conjuncts 
and so we're going to have only the dot outside the parentheses. Another fill in the blank problem. Um, so we're using constructive dilemma CD on lines one and two. And so what would we get on line three if we use constructive dilemma? So it's a disjunction, but the disjuncts have to match the conjuncts of the two conditionals in our conjunction on line one. So it's going to be not S or tilde S wedge tilde Q. So now we're going to look at some proofs where we're going to go through step by step, try to figure out what the next step of the proof can be. Remember that oftentimes for proofs, there's more than one way of proving it correctly. So you sometimes do have um, multiple paths to pursue and any answer to a proof that is valid in each step is correct. They're all equally valid. The only reason you might have for preferring one uh, way of answering the proof to another is if one takes fewer steps. You could say it's more efficient in that sense. So our conclusion is S wedge Q. A good first step is to try to identify where S and Q occur in our premises. And you can see them on lines two and three and they're a consequence of a conditional. So what rule does that suggest we might be using? We have a disjunction we're trying to prove S wedge Q and our two disjuncts appear as consequence of conditionals. The answer is we should be thinking about constructive dilemma. Uh, however, in order to set up the constructive dilemma, we need to create a conjunction out of lines two and three, but we would also need a disjunction that matches the antecedents of those conditionals, M and R. So how do we do that? The answer is we can use uh, disjunctive syllogism on lines one and four. So you'll notice line one is a disjunction Line four is the negation of one of the disjuncts, not P. So we can use not P or tilde P to prove the other disjunct M wedge R must be true. And that's what we wanted to get to set up our constructive dilemma. However, before we use the constructive dilemma rule, we have to create a conjunction out of the conditionals on lines two and three. So remember, we're going to have to introduce um, sets of parentheses to indicate that the dot is the main operator. The horseshoes are not the main operator. And then finally, we can use construct dilemma on lines five and six to derive our disjunction S wedge Q. Let's look at another um, sample proof. So in this case, we're trying to prove the disjunction Q wedge tilde S. Um, and you can see that exact expression is in the consequent of a conditional in line one. And how could we prove the consequent of a conditional using our implication rules? What rule do you use to prove the consequent of a conditional? The answer is modus ponens, but modus ponens requires that we have a line of the proof that has the antecedent already and then if we have that antecedent then we could use modus ponens with our conditional to prove the consequent q wedge tilde s but if you look at that antecedent m wedge tilde p we do not yet have that on a line of the proof so how could we derive that we start by simplifying m out of line two you'll notice the antecedent m wedge tilde p does have m in it so it's not a bad first step to just try to get M by itself. But where, oh, where could we get our wedge tilde P from? The answer is using addition on line three with M to create exactly the antecedent we want, M wedge tilde P. Then we can use modus ponens with lines one and four to derive the consequent of that conditional, and that concludes this proof.